I love the days when kickboxing, when they would bow in the ring and they would wear a black belt. Then that got kind of lost as kickboxing got more popular. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 612. My guest today is Mr. Shannon Hudson. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for Martial Arts Radio, founder here at Whistlekick, and I love martial arts. I love traditional martial arts. I've been doing it my whole life. It's my favorite thing in the world, and that's why we do all the things that we do over here at Whistlekick. And it's a long list. If you want to see the whole list, go to whistlekick.com. Check it all over projects, our products, our services, the various things that we do to support you, the traditional martial artist, as an individual, as an instructor, as a school owner, as a professional, whatever you do, if what you do involves traditional martial arts, there's probably something related to what we do that you would find beneficial, including the show. So head on over there. One of the things you're going to find, there's our store, whistlekick.com has a store. It's where we sell some stuff. And if you use the code podcast 15, it's going to save you 15% on any of the things that we have available over there. Check it out. Maybe you'll find something you like. Now, the show itself gets its own website. We keep things separate. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to go for the show. And why would you go over there? Well, you can sign up for the newsletter. You could make a donation for the work that we do. You could check out the photos, links, social media, videos, transcripts for the episodes. They're all over there. Every single episode we've ever done is available for free. Plenty of podcasts hide them. But remember, this is 612, 612 episodes of content, actually plus some bonus episodes that we have never put behind a paywall. And unless something really weird happens, we never will. The show comes out twice a week. And why do we do it? Why do we do this show? Well, it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. And if you want to support that work, there are lots of ways you can do it. I I gave you a few earlier, but a couple others. You could share an episode, tell friends where you train about what we do. Maybe you can leave a review somewhere, grab a book, or support our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. It's a place where we post exclusive content. And at two bucks a month, you get behind the scenes info. It's the only place to find out who's coming up on the show. Five bucks, you get a bonus episode. Ten bucks, you get bonus video. And it goes up from there. The more you contribute, the more we give you. Now, today's guest is someone that I've known for a couple years, not really well, but I like him. He's a great guy. His brother's been on the show. We've had the chance to train together, and I think very highly of him for a number of reasons. And we talk about all of them. This is a man who's involved in a martial arts business, and I would say it is probably the biggest martial arts business that you've never heard of. That's my guess. Now, maybe you've heard of it. We'll get there eventually, but this is something substantial. And I was super pumped to talk about not only Shannon's journey, but how he took his passion for martial arts and just ran with it in a business sense, kind of like what we're doing here with Whistle Kick. So hang back, check it out, enjoy, and I'll see you in the outro. Shannon, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, it's great to have you here. It's, you know, we were talking before we got started. It's been, it's been a few years since I've seen you. Three, almost, yeah, yeah. almost three. I, I don't get the opportunity to know everybody, of course, before they come on the show. And, you know, it's a long list of people who've been on the show who I want to get to know and train with and everything. But, you know, we've we've been in the same place, the same time, I, I think, more than once. A couple of times, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Martial arts world's pretty small, so. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. People say that. It's, it's big and it's small. It's mm-hmm. really interesting. There are so many people who participate. But then you get the people who've been participating for a while, and that's a much tighter group. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. Spot on. And and I find that interesting, and I'm sure we're going to get into that. And there are a lot of things that we can talk about today, a lot of places that I'm hoping we go. We won't go all, all of those spots because we can't. We don't have the time. I want to start with probably the only obvious question I'm going to ask you, and, that, and that's, and that's the, the why. Why did you get started? You know, what's that origin story look like? So you want that story? <laughs> yeah, let's, you know, if, if we start there, that usually gives me more than enough yeah. to follow up. So, you know, take that however you want to take that. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. Uh, Is, issue one of your comic book. Yeah, I, I love the story. Uh, I love telling the story. It's a pretty, uh, at least I like the story. I don't know if people like it. <laughs> You're the I, only one that really matters on right, that, right? It's right, your story. Exactly. So I like it. <laughs> um, you know, my brother, which you know, Kevin. I do. Hurricane. Uh, started martial arts when I was born, 1979. 
So I remember very vividly as a toddler going to a karate school and sitting on the side and watching my brother do karate class. I remember that like it was yesterday. And when I turned seven, almost eight, I, of course, wanted to follow my big brother's footsteps and do karate class. And it was back when it wasn't a real business. It was a for the owner. It was the, the owner had a real job and would do like Monday, Tuesday, Thursday class from six to eight. And that was it. Right. And there weren't many kids. It was mostly adults. And I was one of the very few kids. And, you know, the teaching practices were not as sharp and great as they are today. I mean, you would spar day one, you would get hit, no headgear. I mean, it was like, you know, one of those type of places, right? And then, <laughs> but the instructor, the owner was super, you know, great guy. And my brother became a black belt there and one of the top black belts in the school. And he started doing karate tournaments. And I remember going to the Battle of Atlanta, watching my brother, because I'm in South Carolina. We're not very far from Atlanta, Georgia. And and then in the 80s, kickboxing got, you know, pretty popular and got on TV. And my brother wanted to be a world champion kickboxer. And then when he started competing in the ring, I would, of course, go and watch. And, and that's how I got into it. And, you know, to this day, I, I'm still doing it. And uh, my brother's still doing it. And we get to work together a good bit. And we've traveled to many, many, many seminars, many fights around the world. And, uh, you know, the career's been really good to me. And martial arts, I, I tell you, it was my saving grace because I was a very, you know, shy kid, not a lot of confidence, very small kid. Uh, I got a, a name. My name is Shannon, <laughs> right? I get picked. I got picked on with that. So martial arts gave me a lot of confidence, and I'm proud to say today I ha- I have the confidence to lead a company that's in 17 countries and thousands and thousands of members across the world do nine round. So I'm very proud of that, and I attribute that to a good family, great sibling, great mom and dad, and the martial arts. That was it. That was my military. My dad was a military guy, and my military was martial arts. And um, so that's how I got to where I am today. Yeah. I I know we're going to get deep into Nine Round because there's going to be a point in your story where we can't separate you from the company. I, I know that as someone who's owned businesses, and especially when you're taking a business that launches out of a passion. But before we get there, we've got to go through the karate steps into the kickboxing steps. I know yeah. that that's a really important point. And it's because of kickboxing that I know you. You know, yeah. it's our, our mutual association with Superfoot. And it was, you know, through Superfoot that I, that I met your brother. How, how much older is Kevin? Kevin is eight and a half years. Okay. Older. So... You know, he, he's a teenager when you get started, old enough that you're really looking up to him. He's, you know, at, at that age, you know, when you're a, a little kid, eight and a half years is a big deal. Yeah. You know, it feels like like this vast gap. I mean, you're looking up to him, you know, almost feels like as big of a difference as your parents, you know, just like those yeah. people over there are so much older. And so, yeah, the eighties kickboxing comes around and. Kevin gets into that. And how old was he when he took his first fight? Because I think your age at that point is is pretty important. Yeah, he was 16 and I was eight. So I, I remember it was at a, a gym in North Carolina, a gymnasium, not not a gym, a weight gym, a gymnasium, right, a, of a school. And in Forest City, North Carolina, I'll never forget it. And I mean, they would play the Rocky music. And uh, it was, <laughs> man, it was good memories, man. Just such good memories. And like like you just said you know you're it, you're eight and we were born the same year you're mm-hmm. 41 42 depending on yep. where your birthday falls eight's a long time ago 33 years ago yeah it's a long time and i can hear in your voice how vividly you remember that, that that's a pivotal moment that's something that became a a metric by which to judge or, or i guess a delineation point is a better word totally. for your upbringing your life and so he steps in at 16. When did you have your first fight? Um, I was, uh, well, in the ring, I did karate tournaments as a kid, obviously, because uh, I just grew up doing that, you know, from sure. karate from my brother. Um, but I, I wanted to get in the ring. I was uh, 16, 15. And, I, and it wasn't kickboxing, believe it or not. It was amateur boxing. Okay. And 
I don't know what made me want to do that direction. Uh, but I did four or five amateur boxing bouts. I had my little passbook, USBA passbook you had to have. And, and then a kickboxing event came up and I said, what the heck? I'm in pretty good shape from boxing. I'll just do that. Why not? So, so for a time being there as an amateur, I would do both. I would float. I would do an amateur boxing bout and I would go do an amateur kickboxing bout two weeks later. And I, I was able to do that. I was able to rack up a lot of fights very quickly. And I, I did it out of, uh, I want the experience. And I knew the more I got under that pressure in that on the, in the ring, I, the better I would get. And I, and I would just, I wanted to fight anybody anywhere again, not out of arrogance, but out of, I just wanted that experience. Mm. And, and I had a great time doing it. And I, I learned a ton. I love to box. I still watch boxing today. Um, I love to kick too. So, uh, it's my, it's helped me, I think. That desire to step in the ring whenever you could. And even so much so that you said, fine, you know, I, I I grew up in karate. I don't even care if I don't kick. I'll get in the ring. I'll just punch mm-hmm. people. That sounds like it's a lot more than just following in your brother's footsteps. That that is that a tie back to, you know, size, name, that that stuff that you pointed out a few minutes ago? Yeah. Is there something to prove? Yeah, oh, sure. I mean, absolutely. I, you know, being the younger kid, you know, being the baby, right, of the family, you know, being who I was, I, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to be for, you know, a badass, if I can say that on here, I said, that's what I wanted to be. And, um, you know, and then when I was 18, 19, guess what? I wanted to start lifting weights and I wanted to be bigger and I started lifting weights and, and, you know, I realized, uh, quickly that the bigger you get muscularly, the heavier weight class you are, the taller the fighters are. <laughs> <laughs> and the more dangerous the fighters are because, you, you know, a fighter fighting at 170 is coming down from 190 to 170. Nice. And I was trying to come up. I mean, I started amateur boxing at 130, 130 pounds. I won my, um, I fought in the World Combat League at 147 a good bit and won my world title at 154. So, you know, weight 10 pounds is a lot when you're the size we are is a lot on someone, but, but, but yes, but back to your point, something to prove. Absolutely. I mean, I still have that in my gut today. I, I, I think I want to be successful. I'm going to be great at, at whatever I try to put my hands on. I want to do it amazingly. I want my kids to look up and say, wow, my dad was a real killer. He was a, he was awesome, you know? And so, yeah, I still have that drive today. And, and, maybe having being smaller stature and maybe having the name has really driven me and helped me. So that's a little psychology, my psychology lesson today. Thank you. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You know, I, I can, I can relate to it. You know, we're, we're about the same size. We're the same age. We came up, you know, different areas, of course, but you know, the times were similar enough. You, you've yeah. got the, the awkward first name. I've got the awkward last name. You know, to the point where I punch it in my phone and it auto corrects. You know what it's auto correcting to every time. <laughs> well, I mean, it's I've trained it, but you get a new phone, right? You know what I'm talking about. Oh, of course, absolutely. <laughs> and so, have having something to prove that chip on your shoulder. I, I get it now. World Combat League. You know, there's mm-hmm. something that we haven't talked about on the show, and possibly since your brother was on. How did that opportunity come along? Yeah, it was. Uh... You know, at the time, I was a, a top amateur in the country. I, I won a, a good bit of accolades with amateur kickboxing. And my brother got a call from Corey Schaefer of the ISKA and said, Chuck Norris has put together a, a team fight concept. Would you guys be interested in doing it uh, for you and your brother? And, and he's talking to Kevin and, and my brother says, sure, Shannon's an amateur though. And he said, well, we have to turn pro. and I said, heck yeah, why not? You know, let's do it. So, so that was my pro debut in the kickboxing world, uh, the World Combat League fight. And you can see a few of those on YouTube. And, you know, I, I had a blast. It was a, a, you, the great thing about that is you didn't have to fight a long, hard, a, a lot of rounds. You would do one and one half and one the other half of the event. Everybody would fight one round. So, but it was very fast paced and the pay for the one round was pretty decent. So, and it was fun. I got to meet Chuck Norris and, um, you know, and, uh, be a rock star at these events because they put you in uniforms and it was a lot of fun. I had a blast. I was on every season they had 
they had three mm-hmm. three years. I was fortunate enough to be on every one, and I learned a lot from it, and made some friends, and had a great time. At any point, as you started spending more time in, let, let's call it the boxing kickboxing world, and we might have some people listening who are really seeing the the gap, and and everybody draws it differently, but there's a noticeable difference between the way kickboxing and karate are trained and taught and and the culture around them did you leave karate behind or were you training these two things in parallel it's a great question um they were in parallel yes i you know i'm a martial artist at heart i grew up in that environment and i respect tradition and i enjoy it and i think you know, I talk, my brother and I talk about this a lot. I love the days when kickboxing, when they would bow in the ring mm. and they would wear a black belt. And then that got kind of lost as kickboxing moved, you know, got more popular and moved on. And, um, and I wish some elements of that tradition were back in kickboxing. I think it may, gave it an element of class. I think it was very classy that way. And having pants instead of shorts, I think, again, made it classy. But yes, I did it in tandem until I uh, started my company, you know, and started, you know, life happens, you have kids, you get busy, and and you don't get to do as many traditional karate classes as you used to. But I still love it. Uh, I uh, have a great respect for it. I think there's a place for it. And I think think the best kickers in the world and the best martial artists in the world came from a traditional background. Hmm. I mean, look at Mr. Wallace or... You know, my brother, Joe Lewis, I mean, all the greats come from, you know, Bruce Lee, come from a traditional background in martial arts. So I think those are the best. Some of the best kickboxers did too. I mean, look at some of those, the greats, they started in traditional karate. Look at, you know, Rick Rufus, Johnny Terrio, those guys started in a traditional karate program as a kid. And yeah, so I did it in parallel until life took over. Mm. Yeah, there, there was definitely a, a shift kickboxing early on from you know what what i can see now you know i wasn't that old neither of us were that old as it was really getting its genesis but it seemed to be okay we all do these different things where's our common ground and and how do we how do we test each other and that seemed like what early kickboxing was and it's become a very separate thing no you're right yeah and it's uh you know and i'm not passing a judgment you know, there are people who loved that and don't love this and people who love this and, and wouldn't have as, been as engaged in that. You know, it, things change, the world changes and and we move on and we look for opportunities. And you've brought it up a couple of times. And I already said after the first time, you know, I, I don't think there's much going to be much opportunity for us to separate a good portion of the story from your company. So nine round and we're we're going to have two types of people listening and hearing that name people who are saying what's nine round and people Mm -hmm. who are saying holy cow nine round (laughs) this is the guy who started that yeah Yeah. and as far as i'm concerned in the world of martial arts and martial arts businesses because i I consider nine round to be a, a martial arts business it's probably the biggest thing that people don't know about i would agree i would agree with you and i and and i don't know how that happens well, shame on me. My marketing obviously needs help, right? <laughs> well, well, maybe, maybe, maybe not, right? Because are you, but b- before we go there, because I, I don't, <laughs> you know, we're friends. I don't want, I don't want any of the listeners to think, you know, I'm, th- I'm like throwing shade at you, or, you oh, know, no. trying, trying to kick low here. Let, let's talk about where it started. And then, and then we, I think we can, we can talk about why that might be, you know, what, what yeah. was, what was the origin story for nine rounds? Yeah, I have some thoughts on why that may be, but but backing up to the nine round origin. Well, you know, my my brother ended up purchasing the karate school we grew up in, right? So, so the natural progression is my brother was the top, you know, one of the top black belts buys the buys the karate school, actually just pays back rent, you know, and and takes over the karate school. So my first job was at a karate school teaching kids karate. That was it. That was my first job, and. Uh, when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, doing, teaching um, the kids how to bow and say yes, sir, and all this. And, and, and that's where I really learned 
um, how to sell memberships right there uh, and how to communicate very well. I think it's a skill a lot of martial arts school owners neglect how they, you know, they think, oh, if I just have the best product and that people will buy it. And that's not the case. I mean, look at McDonald's, terrible product, but everybody, but they sell a lot of burgers, right? So, um, so that was my first job. And my, and my brother and I, after I went to college, I didn't go to college, best six years of my life. Um, (laughs) <laughs> That's a joke. Um, after college, we grew the karate business. We went in business together and we grew it to three locations in the upstate of South Carolina. And we did very well. I mean, we had a great following. Uh, each school had probably 200 members at it. Um, you know, we were just doing great and living the uh, American dream. And the challenge I noticed with that business model is it's hard to scale, which means, you know, hard to duplicate. And one of the reasons that makes it hard is it's hard to get instructors that have the combination of great at martial arts, but great at teaching because it, and let's be honest, it takes time to get really good at martial arts. I mean, to become a black belt, you know, three, five years, whatever in your system it takes. And that's just a really slow, a slow way to create instructors. And I couldn't create them fast enough. We couldn't duplicate the business, the instructors fast enough and had build this amazing team. So, I, you know, looking around, I noticed a business out there that was a 30 minute circuit and it was women only. And I was just really enamored with that business. And it was called Curves. I don't know if you've heard, you remember it, Curves. I have. And I said, man, now that's a business model right there. You know, circuit training, no class time for the customer, small square footage, low overhead, not a lot of team members. You don't need 20 people. Like a, like a restaurant, you might need 20, 30, 50 people. You don't with this. And I can find people that are athletic and love fitness very easily. And the punching and kicking, there's, you know, kicking front side round kick and punching straight ones, hook ones and uppercut ones. I only got a few moves to deal with here. So not a lot of moving parts to the business. And my wife, uh, bless her heart, she didn't know what she was getting into. Uh, 2008, we leased a space, me and my wife. You know, 2008 was happening. Everybody knows the economy was in the tank. And... My brother opted to not be a part of this. You know, he's like, you know, it's, you know, the economy's bad or karate schools aren't doing what I, what we wanted to do. And, but he was fully supportive and like, hey, go for it. And so me and my wife went in business together and opened this 1100 square foot spot next to one of our karate schools. And after 30 days, we had almost a hundred members. And we knew we had something very special there. And when we built that first studio, we maxed out the only credit card we had. We just scraped and, you know, there were no sushi dinners. It was like, you know, we did. And we just scraped it together. And it we're was... all in. Yes. No plan B. That was our, our quote. There's no plan B. We're going to make this thing work. And and sure enough, uh, you know, it went well. And I'm happy to say we have 700 units across the world. And we have thousands and thousands, you know, 80, 90,000 members in the system right now. And it's funny, martial arts owners will be like, my school has 200 members or 300. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, that's great. That's awesome. Great yeah, job. I, I got 80,000 members. <laughs> but I don't say that. I don't say that. No, just, no, yeah. no. You're, but, you're far too humble for that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and, and internally, I have my internal ego statement. I say, yeah. I want to get more. I say, I want to get more people punching and kicking than Bruce Lee did. And uh, I know I don't say that out loud because people probably trash me pretty hard to say that. But um, people, if people want to trash you, they're going to they're going to find some reason. Right, right. But we're just at that point in the world now. But I'm happy to say, you know, that uh, I have a lot of people punching and kicking out there because of this. And because that's what I grew up doing and I love doing it. So so that's that's the story. Now we have. 45 people in the office here um, where I'm sitting now and, uh, you know, legal people and people far smarter than me. And uh, I just try to assemble a good team and give them a vision and direction to go. And here we are. Awesome. Now I want, I want to go back. I want to go back to the part of the story that I think is most important as someone who started several businesses, as someone who is, you know, neck deep in one of them now that, initial point, that point where you say, here's a concept, and I believe in it pretty strongly. You know, most people will hedge their bets. They'll say, you know, I'm going to start this business. 
uh, I'm going to look for the right time. I'm going to look for the right space. You know, your brother was looking for the right economy or economic uh, indicators. And you said, you know, screw all that. I'm jumping in with both feet. I'm bringing my family along with me. And I am so all in on this that there is, in your words, no plan B. Where did that faith in a incredibly simplified martial arts concept, right? The roots of this are martial arts. Correct. We're, we're taking an aspect of martial arts, really the, the fitness component. And there's a curriculum there, but it's pretty simple. And investing everything you had, time, money, energy, into that. What was it about your experience as a martial artist, I assume as a competitor, I assume as working in a martial arts school that made you believe this concept would work? That's a good question, Jeremy. Uh, uh, what, you know, I, one of the things I'm blessed with that um, I, I'm very blessed with is good intuition. And I think everyone can have good intuition, but do they follow it, right? Do they trust it enough and have faith, like you said, to act on it and make it become a reality. And it, my personality and the way I am is, uh, my wife jokes around, ready, fire, aim, you know, and that's just how I do things. And I, it's, uh, sometimes it serves me very well, that type of personality. And sometimes it doesn't, you know, um, if I'm going to have a cheap meal and eat bad, Boy, do I do it, man! I go all in on that thing. I mean, <laughs> the fries and the burgers and this milkshake. And if you're gonna do it, do it right. I, I do it, man. I don't halfway at anything, anything. I mean, all the way. And you know, my I think you know, I my parents taught me that if you're gonna do something, do it well. You know, if you're gonna clean up the yard, pick it all up, do it right. I mean, my, again, I, I mentioned briefly, my dad's a military guy, and that's how he was. You know, um, he wasn't you know, super strict on me, but he instilled that value in me. And, you know, so we went all in on this thing. And, uh, you know, I mean, I always say I'm not going to die. You know, I mean, it's just money, right? Money's like, like, it's just paper. It's just a piece of paper. It's just digits on a computer. It's like, I can get more of the money, right? But if I don't try this, I'll, I'll live with this regret inside. And too many people do that. I, you know, if, if people would just go all in and, and, and have the faith and make it happen. No plan B attitude. I mean, I think a lot more people would be happy today. Um, but yeah, so that's a great question. Mm. I don't know if I even answered it, but it's a good way. <laughs> you did a little bit, but, but we're going to go back and I'm going to ask it in a little bit different way. Cause you gave me another piece to draw on. Now you use the word intuition. Mm -hmm. Yes. Another word that we could use. It's kind of similar is instinct. Correct. And as a fighter, as someone who was in the ring a lot, I'm sure every time you stepped in, you had a plan. But Correct. plans change. You know, there's that famous Mike Tyson quote, plan <laughs> until you get hit in the face, right? We, we, most of us know that quote. So you have to trust your instincts. At some point, you fought enough. I'm imagining you learned to trust your instincts in the ring. Is that a fair? Oh, it's, totally. You're so right. And that's probably where it can come from. I mean, you you have to have that trust in the ring, you know, or else you'll get hurt, right? So, yeah, totally, totally. That's probably where they come from. Okay. Now, we mentioned earlier, I think you've got one of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing, mm -hmm. that a lot of martial artists don't know about. And, you know, if somebody didn't know that, you know, we, we know each other, we've trained together, they might think, man, Jeremy's, Jeremy's being kind of harsh. But I think it's actually two things. One, I, I think there's a compliment in there because it's it's huge, right? Eight, I don't know any other martial arts company that has 80,000, 90,000 people. You know, there, there, might, there might be some organizations out there that, that do, um, but I'm not aware of them. But I think the more, more important part is the is the typical attendee at a nine round gym, the same person who's going to go to a traditional karate class. It's not right. 
And, and that was my expectation. And I think that's probably why. Is, yeah. is that is that your assessment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not. It's, I mean, 70% of our member base is female and, you know, between 25 and 35 years old. So, that, and that's not what's going in the karate schools today. So th- that's why. And our owner base is the same way, our franchise owners. Hmm. It's not the martial arts people that are doing this. It's people that love fitness, are passionate about fitness and understand business. And th- th- they make the best owners because, you know, they understand we're in business. We, we have to be profitable. We have to, you know, to help our community, we have to hire people and be profitable. And yeah, so, so you nailed it. That's, that's exactly the demographic. It's just different. Hmm. But, and, you know, people, people are going to look at that and they're going to say, well, you know, it's not martial arts. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Depends on what your definition of martial arts is. I'm not going to equate it. It is, if martial arts is a, a, a scale, it's not as martial artsy as, you know, a Shotokan karate school class, you know, a, a, a WTF taekwondo class in school. But I'm a firm believer. Anything that gets people punching and kicking is a good that's, thing. That's my life mission. That's it. Get as many people as I can punching and kicking to better themselves, period. End of story. That, that's what I was put here to do. And people can trash me all day or, or uh, you know, talk bad. And that means I'm doing some great things. You know, if you don't have a few haters, you're not doing anything, right? So you got to get yourself some right. haters out there, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And, and you can call, yeah, I, you call it what you want, but. Hey, I got a lot of people punching and kicking and to better themselves, not to hurt things or harm things or to, but to better themselves. And what, a, what, a, what a way to live, right? I get to right. uh, wake up every day knowing that I have a lot of people getting better because they're using martial arts, which is what saved me. And, you know, how fast can I spread it and how far can I go? So that's, mm-hmm. that's my mentality. I can't imagine that someone's going to step into nine round and become less likely to engage in other martial arts. I I can only imagine that if someone says, you know, this is cool, but I, I, it's not for me. They're probably more likely to seek out a traditional martial arts class than they were before they started. Of course. Yeah. That's my guess. And so if we look at it, even if we just look at it that way, even if someone looks at what you're doing and says, you know, this isn't martial arts, and take the, that that lump of people and that you know all those locations, and they say you know this this isn't this isn't karate, this isn't kung fu, whatever. You're creating exposure. You're getting people yep. interested, and totally. I see a lot of synergy there, and this is part of why I not only wanted to acknowledge the story, but kind of dig into the story, because one of my core beliefs, and actually Andrew and I just recorded an episode about this earlier today, you know, who gets to decide what is and isn't martial arts? Right, right. Exactly. We, we all get to have our opinions on it. We're yeah. going to have some disagreements and we can have some conversation about it. But who uh, among us is ordained to determine this is and this is not martial arts, right? <laughs> that's, that's an incredibly <laughs> arrogant thing to say. And I just tend to take the, maybe it's a, maybe I'm dodging the subject, but I don't get to say what is and what isn't. I have my opinions on what is and isn't. I'm going to do what works for me and you go do what works for you. And that person over there can do what works for them. And all of your members can do what works for them. And everybody's happy. And what's wrong with that? Yeah, I know. You're right. You can't be so judgmental, right? Come on. I mean, just... (laughs) Now, you made a statement about martial arts saving you. And... I'm not quite sure what that word choice was referencing. Well, saving, I don't think I was going down a bad path. Maybe I should, maybe saving was the wrong word, but it it gave me direction, you know? Mm. I I mean, it gave me an outlet to be, to be more confident, to be stronger. And when I was a kid and sparring and I would, you know, you know, win or hit, you know, learn to, score a point or whatever, you know, it gives you a boost, right? It gives you an endorphin hit. It gives you some confidence, right? So, um, and I honestly don't know where I would be without that. You know, I, I don't know. Um, 
I took that same discipline. I, and as a high schooler, I started playing golf and I was on the golf team and, and, you know, love the, love that game to this day. I mean, I think fighting and golf have a lot of similarities. You know, you don't, you know, when, you, when it comes down to it, it's really just you and everything relies on you. <laughs> so, um, so I, saving me, I, I wasn't going down a bad path. It was just, it gave me direction and gave me something to focus my energy on. I mean, I'm always high strung, high energy guy. I'm standing right now at a standing desk. I can't sit still. So, <laughs> hey, me too. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, yeah. And, and maybe not saving, but, but it gave me great direction as a kid. And I'm very happy. I had that outlet of martial arts. Where do you think you would have ended up? You know, if you were, if we could, if we go back, let's, let's go back in time and, Kevin never starts karate. <laughs> That's a great question. Where uh, do you think your life would be now? I have no clue. I have no, no clue. I mean, I've always been athletic. Uh, you know, they wanted me to wrestle in high school. I didn't. I played golf instead. I, I wish <laughs> I had wrestled though, right? But um, I have no clue what I would be doing. I have no clue. Um, maybe I, you know, maybe I went in the military. Mm. Uh, you know, like my dad did. Uh, I. I Wish I would have done that. Um, went in the military. I respect those men and women so much that do that. Um, in fact, with Nine Round, we give a discount on the franchise fee, a veteran discount. We veterans are great franchisees. They run the play really well, work hard. And, but um, you know, but I don't know where I'd be. That's, that's a that's a great question. Well, maybe we can attack that question from a different from the other side, right? I'm sure that there's a there's an amount and you don't need to tell me what the amount is but there's an amount where somebody shows up and they say i want to buy nine round from you mm -hmm. and you say all right and they say you know with with this amount you you can't be involved anymore you have to go off and do something else and so i would imagine most people you know they they take that windfall and you know maybe they do a little bit of traveling but as a, a high functioning individual like you somebody who is always looking for that next mission right? mm -hmm. if, if, listeners if you go if you go back if you listen over the last 20 minutes or so there's a lot of language choice in here that that shows how driven you are you're you're not saying that you're driven but it's very clear how driven mm -hmm. you are i can't imagine that you're going to spend the rest of your life at your age now not working not finding the new mission you're oh. going to come up with something and i would be surprised if you hadn't thought about it a little bit at one point so does that give you any clarity on what what you might do as an alternative if, if this hadn't happened? Oh, of course. I mean, I, if if I could not be a part of Nine Round today and someone said you have to be go off in the sunset, I would be bored out of my mind in two weeks. I would be like, what the heck? I would be like, oh my God, I've got to create something. You know, I, I love to build. I love to create. I mean, I think we're all creators, right? And we're on this earth to create, create memories, create experiences, create love, create whatever it is. And I love to create. Uh, I enjoy business. I do. Um, can I take my passion of punching and kicking and put that together in a business? And would I do it again? Would do it with some a different spin if I were not with Nyra? Absolutely. And I've thought about that before. And uh, I, I know how I would do it. I know the direction I would go. And it would be great. It would be no plan B mentality and give me five years with it. I'll have something else very spectacular, you know, because I mean, I just know I can do it. I, I've, I've built more confidence over the past 13 years with nine round, how to build a team, how to, how to work, how to franchise, how to find franchise partners. You know, I know how to do it. Uh, I, I get it. And I would, I could build something better, better and faster. So, and I would, I would test myself to see if I could do it and I would go all in, man. I would do it. You'd be interviewing me and that logo would be different on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listeners, I'm looking at the nine round logo. You know, we we, we do these interviews yeah. audio only just because I, I pace and everything. And I, I joke with, with the, the guests that, you know, they can pick their nose all they want and nobody's going to know. And <laughs> we just make it easy on the editing side too. Yeah, I, I, that's that's giving me some some clarity. It, it's opening up some some things here. Um, and we're building a picture. We're building a picture of, of you, of who you are, and, and of what makes you tick. 
So the, the question is, as you launched this thing and as it's taken your time, as it's become this thing that you've created, you already indicated that your time physically training in martial arts has reduced. But as I've found with basically the same story, as I've invested myself into Whistlekick, my time for physical training is, you know, it's just not as available. Right. But there's a, there's a, there's a mental martial arts. There's a thought process. There's in, in business, anybody who's been in business, especially entrepreneurship understands that there are, you know, when you're sparring somebody, you've got two hands and two feet to worry about when you're in business in a, an in industry that people don't want you there. No, nobody, nobody lets you in. Nobody says, Hey, come on in right. and carve off some of the market share and you can have some of our money. And you're in an incredibly competitive industry and an industry that has had a real resurgence in a few different ways over the last decade. You're doing business martial arts, mental martial arts, however you want to think of it. Tell us what that looks like. Tell us about how your time training fighting has given you some some tools. What's that toolkit look like? And, and how are you referring back to lessons from the dojo in your business life? Oh, yeah, there's so many parallels. I mean, and I think I heard uh, uh, Dan Pena say that some, I don't know if you guys have ever followed him. Uh, it's called the billion dollar man, but he says all of his high performers either were military or martial arts people. And so, so martial arts will help anyone in business. Absolutely. And it help, has helped me tremendously. A lot of things it, I relate it to is like levels, like martial arts levels. You have yellow belt, orange belt, green belt, right? You have these ranks. And I think of business that way, you know, you, you start out and you're a white belt, right? And then you learn a little more and you get a little better at executing. And now you're, you know, maybe yellow or orange and you, you grow and there's no end. See, that's the beautiful thing about martial arts and business. You can't reach the top. I mean, you're either improving or you're going backwards, right? You're either like, I don't know if you guys have read the book, um, um, the infinite game by Simon Sinek. Uh, yeah. talks about there is no winning in business. You're either ahead or you're behind, right? So the same thing in martial arts. You're either driving forward and moving ahead or you're not. And you're not really winning at it. You just, there's no end to it. And it's a constant improvement. And things like perseverance, you know, being able to stick it out when it's tough. You know, we just recently had, you know, we're still going through the pandemic. And man, that's, that doesn't test your stick to itiveness muscle. My gosh, I don't know what yeah. will I would cause man. And I'm telling you, I'm proud to say we have our brand, our company is better today than we were before. We have more money in the bank than we had before. We have more teammates on the team than we had before. And I relate all that to the, all the martial arts training of, of being patient, of going through the levels of being disciplined and studying. Uh, you know, when you're learning a new form in martial arts, you, do, you don't just pick it up on the first day. You got to practice and study and figure it out and work on it. And the same with business. I have to study and read and go to seminars and learn how to work Zoom and <laughs> learn how to work with my team. You know, so, so all that is the exact same thing as going through a martial arts journey. So, so yeah, uh, a lot of parallels between martial arts and business. And I want to become a black belt in business. And, and black, as you guys all know, black belt, like Shodan, means first level. So I always think, my, my brother always says a black belt is a white belt that never quit. Mm. But a black belt is like the beginning level. So I, I consider myself... Uh, maybe a brown belt in business, but maybe, I don't know, but when I get to black, I'm just, just the first level. I got to keep going. So a lot of similarities. You're right. I, I, I think you're being a little too humble there. Maybe, okay, maybe I'm a, I, I know how difficult it is to run a business the size that I run. <laughs> I know that as you add people and you add complexity and, mm -hmm. and now, you know, you're talking about franchisees, that's even more complex. And, and listeners out there, when, 
in my, in my past life in, in IT, you know, I spent, uh, it was about a year, a little over a year, we had a single location. And then we added a second location. People thought, oh, so you have twice as much to do, twice as many problems. No, 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 I had at least four times. <laughs> when you think about the complexity as you expand a business, that, that growth, uh, that complexity growth is exponential. It is not linear. And so I, I take that knowledge into the way I'm, I'm thinking about you and what you're doing. If you are not a showed on in business, I don't know who <laughs> is, my friend, because it's not me. Well, thank you. I'm, you're, I'm, you're, keeping this, you're keeping this thing going. You know, obviously, it's successful. But I think that, that what, you're, what you're pointing out there, I think, is incredibly relevant because your approach in business, if you are thinking of it that way, is similar to the way the most successful martial arts students, instructors, fighters look at their practice. How can I improve? Where are my weak points? Where do I shore things up? Who can I seek out that can help me improve? You know, you you mentioned you mentioned book. You talked about other people in very positive lights. I imagine you have mentors and others, probably within and outside the company, people you go to to say, "What should I do here? What do you think about this?" You're not just charging forward. No, you're crafting no, you're a strategy. So, you're so right. I mean, I have business coaches I listen to. I have, I mean, I use my phone, my, uh, my phone, like a coach too. Like a lot of people think they think I need a, I need a mentor and they think I need someone to sit down and have coffee with every Saturday. And that sounds all nice and rosy, but that's not how the real world world works. You're probably not going to get that people. Um, but you can have a lot of mentors around you, whether it's books, whether it's YouTube channels, whether it's podcasts like this, uh, and my, one of my favorite episodes of yours was the, uh, um, uh, the, the movie, um, best of the best. Oh man. I love that. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but anyway, of course but, you, you bring, you bring up the episode about the movie that I have become known for disliking. <laughs> yeah. Terrible acting in the movie, but anyway, um, but yeah, so mentors are, are not people listening. You don't, don't feel bad that you don't have someone to go coffee with. I mean, use, use these channels like YouTube and podcasts and use books and, and, um, you know, and seminars you can take, uh, and you can do a lot of them online now. I mean, I do that all the time so much. I mean, that's how I learn. And I pick up little nuggets here and nuggets here and nuggets here. And for, you know, it, I got something pretty good with all these nuggets I put together. So, um, that, that's how I believe you should continually be learning. Just like, in martial arts, you know, you go to a seminar, you learn something, you put it in your little toolbox that works for you. Um, I mean, the way the way Bill Wallace kicks on certain things might not work for certain people, right? They don't have that flexibility. They don't have that rhythm and timing and to do it like he does, but uh, some of it might. So uh, that's how I approach business. Seems to work okay. <laughs> nice. Now, you mentioned earlier that most of the people who are going to sign on for a nine round franchise are not martial artists. Right. But let's see if we can pull something for the martial arts school owners from what you've learned. You spent time in and around the school that your brother bought. You helped him grow that. You learned at least some things about business and running a martial arts school there. So when we take the, the 13 years of nine round and everything you've learned there, if you were to go back and either start your own traditional martial arts school or maybe be a consultant or something. What were some of the, what are some of the things that you would be doing differently than maybe most people are doing? That's a great question. First off, I would have a blast doing it. Um, <laughs> uh, but a lot of things, I mean, first off, processes are very important. Um, process, having a process for everything of a, you know, a, and can I put it on paper? And can I teach it to someone? So having that a process for bringing on a new student, onboarding a new student, uh, ranking a new student, having these processes are what a lot of people don't have when they go into a business. Um, and processes give you clarity and give you the ability to hand it off. Because people that own a martial arts school usually are doing it out of passion and they're the only one, only employee. And, but when you start to grow and you build a team, you have to be able to hand things off. People call it delegation, but it's also instructing, right? You're delegating, but you have to teach and train. So building processes would be super important if I did it today. 
Uh, number two would be sales and marketing. You got to, there, there's a, unfortunately, martial arts has a stigma of, some, of being somewhat creepy sometimes, martial artists and martial arts schools. And we have to uncreepify that somehow by getting the marketing right and getting the positioning in the community right, the brand positioning. And then I would elevate the look of the studio of the schools and make them ex- just freaking immaculate. You know, I think that instead of just laying down some mats, See, if you're not careful, a, a nine round runs into this too. People that don't take it care of it and make it bright and crisp, it'll look dinky, right? So a school with just a, a big open space and mats and a few bags can look very dinky, but how can we elevate the look and feel of it so that I can give great service and charge a premium price point? And that's how I would run martial art. I would charge premium price points. I would have immaculate studios. I'd have processes written down so I could duplicate and scale. I would really get savvy at marketing. I would, I would make my marketing. I would uncreepify the marketing uh, and make it family friendly. And I would be good at marketing sales. And boom, uh, roll the credits. That's how you run a martial arts school. <laughs> Yeah. As someone who had a school briefly, who spends a lot of time consulting with businesses, including martial arts school. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent on what you suggested. <laughs> Systems, marketing, cleanliness. Yep. Huge. Totally. In the right area, the right locations in Porta, you know, being yep. in the right part of town, uh, you know, doing demographic and psychographic studies of where you're going to put the location. These are all things that get pretty complex, but um, you know, I think putting the, the right product in the right place is, is very, very important. I can have the best thing in the world, but if I'm not, you know, if I go fishing and I don't have the right fish around me in the right bait, I'm not going to catch anything. So same thing in business. I got to put them in the right spot, have the right bait, have the right processes in place to do well. And that's what, you know, being a part of a franchise can help people do. We do all that work for the franchisee so they don't have to figure that out. And we have a lot of data points across the world, but little martial arts school owners, you know, the mistake they make is they, they find a spot, they try to negotiate the cheapest rent and get the cheapest rent and they just, you know, go for it. And I admire their, their, uh, gusto, but the, you know, the, the, the planning piece they missed or how to put together a business plan. A lot of them don't do that. So even if you have a, a, a business open, putting together a business plan, you know, anytime, just kind of sitting down and redoing it is a great practice. And we, so it's just another good, a good uh, tidbit of uh, a tip there that can help. Right on. Wow. We've covered a lot of, a lot of different stuff today and, and good right. stuff. And I, I had a feeling that this is what it would turn into. And I'm, I'm glad that it did. So let's talk about the future as yes. we start to fade out here, you know, Let's go back to the reality and you know, nobody, well, I mean, maybe somebody does. I hope they show up with a, a huge amount of money and they say, mm-hmm. here, I want to buy nine run, but let's imagine they don't and things keep going. What's coming, let's say the next five years, if you want to kick it out further than that, that's totally fine for you and for your company. Yeah, great question. Um, first off, um, if you've read the book, Good to Great, great book, by the way, My about favorite. business, um, you have to develop leaders underneath you, right? So uh, it's called a level five leader. I have to develop an executive team that can run the show without me, right? I, mean, I really have to build that. That's how you build a business. I want it to, to live long after I'm here. So so the past year, we, my wife and I have been really working hard on building our executive team. We've hired a new CFO. We brought in a VP of ops. We've, uh, we hired a new franchise development uh, two franchise development officers to help us build the brand and, and award franchises and move to other countries. So we, we focused here lately, you know, we're 13 years old on, it can't be me doing everything or Heather, we have to build a very smart executive team. So we've had to poach them from other brands, steal them away. Right. And, you know, we, we've, we're, we're doing that as we speak and we're proud of that. So we're going to continue that practice. Other things within the brand we're going to be doing is technology based. We're working with, uh, putting screens at each of the rounds so they can see the drill and uh, doing a very innovative things. Uh, heart rate technology with an armband is really innovative. Our, our at home workout nine run now, it's called nine run now. It's an app and we're on all the apps and uh, a lot of, a lot of franchisees are selling it 
along with the membership as a member perk and anyone can buy it. It's on the app store. And, uh, so a lot of tech things happening. Uh, the pandemic has forced us to innovate quickly, which is a good thing. Uh, so we're proud to say we have and, you know, build the executive team, build the dream team, keep building processes, bring on great franchise owners. And the next five years are going to be very bright. We're, we're looking to move into more countries. Uh, we're getting, this year we'll be opening in Viet- Vietnam and Indonesia and Qatar. So there'll be three countries we'll open up this year. Very excited to do those. Uh, and, you know, continue growing, especially the Asia market. I think in the Asian market, we just opened our seventh location in Japan. But Vietnam, we're excited about South Korea, working on a deal in South Korea right now. Uh, so uh, a lot of exciting things. Hey, we love what we do. You know, my wife is the chief operating officer. So if you really want to get into processes, she's your, she's your gal. Uh, I'm a very visionary person. Uh, and we divide and conquer very, very well. I'll say, here's the vision. I have to go create the training process for that. And then boom, she's off to, off to create a manual for that. Right. So her and her team. So uh, I love family businesses. You know, my brother, Kevin works with me as well. Uh, my father, our, our dad used to work with us until we finally made him retire. He was in the warehouse <laughs> packing and shipping. So, uh, no way. uh yeah, he, oh. uh, he was awesome. And, um, and my son is 13 and his first job will probably be when he gets old enough to work. His first job will be in the warehouse. <laughs> I'm going to put him in there. Uh, but right on. it's a family business. We love it. And the uh, next five years, we're very optimistic about the future. That's great. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being here. And, you know, what are your final thoughts or words of wisdom or however you want to phrase it to the people who are listening? Yeah, well, I think one of the best things you can do is put your kid in a, in a quality martial arts program. Um, I think you just have a more, you know, anyone, anyone jump in a quality martial arts program. It's one of the best, it's one of the best personal development programs in the world. Uh, so if you're not, if you're a fan of it and are not training regularly, jump back in and do it. And, uh, the other thing is, Hey, go try a free nine round session. It's 30 minutes. It's a ton of fun. If you're a martial artist at all, you will pick it up very, very quickly and you'll have a good time doing it and you get to see my ugly mug on the wall on the poster so that'll be fun too right so <laughs> so that's it jeremy <laughs> what a fun time that was all of my conversations with shannon have been a ton of fun and i'm sure there will be more in the future looking forward to getting together training again sometime soon we've got some stuff on the horizon so i'm i'm pumped hopefully we get to get to spend some more time together he's a great guy you want to go deeper on the episode, check out some photos, links, go check out Nine Round, any of that stuff. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, find episode 612, and go deep. Go deep. Go deep on this. Go check out other episodes while you're there. Sign up for the newsletter. Maybe throw us a couple bucks, or even better, contribute to the Patreon. And if those methods of support, if those don't make sense for you, totally fine. Anything you do that contributes to what? We're doing our goals here of supporting the traditional martial arts world. Any of it, any of it is legitimate. And of course, don't forget, we've got training programs and we've got a speed development program that is unparalleled. Why is it unparalleled? Because nobody else has made one. This takes science and martial arts principles and gives you a program that will get you faster. I put everything I have on it because it will work. It works. We've tried it. It works. Check it out. Whistlekickprograms.com and you can see all kinds of other things that we've got going over there. There's a slow but steady outflow of new programs headed over there. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 to get you 15% off something at whistlecake.com. And if you've got feedback, guest suggestions, topic ideas, whatever it is, let me know. Jeremy at whistlecake.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Really creative, right? That's how we do things. Keep it obvious. I'm done for now. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? Yeah.